Dear all, welcome to the forum on robotics and control engineering. Uh, I am Tansel, Tansel Yuslun, and I am an assistant professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering of the University of South Florida. Um, at my university, I am also a director of the Laboratory for Autonomy, Control Information and Systems, or short LACES. Um, with the support from my university, I am very proud today to host Dr. Nana Swamin from MIT to participate in our live seminar series on control systems uh, through the force. Uh, I would like to mention a couple of words about the FORCE, and then um, I will introduce uh, Dr. Anaswamy. So FORCE is dedicated to provide free, high-quality outreach events and online seminars uh, to reach broader robotics and control engineering communities around the globe. To support our mission, we periodically invite distinguished lecturers like uh, Dr. Anaswamy to give talks on recent research results related to robotics and control engineering. As such, FORCE aims in connecting academicians and government industry researchers and practitioners with each other through cross-cutting research and education discussions. Uh, we cordially hope that you will enjoy all the FORCE events and find them uh, valuable to your own research interests. Um, let me also say a few words about the WebEx. So during the presentation, um, we are all muted and please ask questions after the presentation. And um, since the session is being recorded to be posted to the FORCE website, um, you can ask questions through the chat box. Um, you can directly send questions to me or to everyone, then everyone, and then I will read your questions to Dr. Anaswamy. All right, so again, I am very proud today uh, to host uh, Dr. Anaswamy. Um, she is the founder and director of the Active Adaptive Control Laboratory in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. She is recognized worldwide as a pi pioneer in adaptive control theory and its applications to aerospace, automotive, and propulsion systems, as well as cyber physical systems, such as smart grids, smart cities, and smart infrastructures. She is an author of over 100 journal publications and 250 uh, conference publications co-author of a well-known graduate textbook on adaptive control and co-author of several cutting-edge science and technology reports, reports. She has received several awards, including the George Alexi and the Control Systems Magazine Best Paper Awards from the IEEE CSS Control Systems Society, the Presidential Young, Young Investigator Award from NSF, the Hans Fischer Senior Fellowship from the Institute for Advanced Study at the uh, Technical University. Muni, the Donald Grom Jewish Prize from the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. She has been elected to be a fellow of the IEEE and IFAC. She received a Distinguished Member Award and a Distinguished Lecture Award from the IEEE CSS. She is actively involved in IFAC, IEEE and IEEE CSS. In IEEE CSS, she has served as Vice President for Conference Activities and Technical Activities, and she will serve as the President in 2020. So, for all of you who are here live for the presentation of uh, her, I first would like to thank you very much, Anu, uh, for participating in our forum, and we are ready whenever uh, you are. Thank you very much, Tanta, for this uh, very kind introduction, and thanks again for inviting me to give a webinar, and I'm uh, excited to uh, share with you the work that we've been doing in our lab on this topic and look forward to receiving questions at the end of the talk. Um, so, the topic here is socio-technical modeling, control, and optimization for urban mobility. So, this is work that we have carried out with the sponsorship of the uh, Ford MIT Alliance, and much of uh, all of what I'm going to present today, as a matter of fact, are work that's been done by um, um, students in my lab, primarily Tao Fan and uh, Yuan Guan. And all of this work was done in collaboration with uh, folks at Ford. And currently, um, um, uh, collaborating with Eric Feng, Eric Fengfield, Ling Zhu, and Crystal Wong, who are all uh, part of the uh, uh, Ford Motor Company. Um, so we all really understand urban mobility. It's, it's something that touches every one of our lives. Um, uh, given that uh, there is a huge and growing amount of uh, population of the world uh, centered around urban living, it is not surprising that there are a number of challenges when it comes to essentially transportation, when it comes to mobility, and it, when it comes to really reaching the destination from a certain starting point. 
there are a number of factors that contributes to this. Um, and first and foremost is pollution. Um, we all understand uh, the statistics that is governing us in terms of huge climate change and all kinds of implications in terms of sustainability. So that is something that really is a challenge that needs to be addressed in more ways than one. Uh, the, while that is a long-term, uh, maybe uh, uh, somewhat of a medium and long-term issue, perhaps not so much <laughs> as, as, as we see the changing climate around us, but there are more immediate concerns that also contributes to this challenge, such as traffic congestion and which introduces enormous stresses, not just in terms of the number of hours that are lost on the road um, uh, going to, 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 to work and returning, but also in terms of the stresses that it places on us both physiologically as well as psychologically. And this actually makes it even worse as the demographics age, and so that, that introduces even, even further challenges. Fortunately for us, there is a number of uh, digital advances uh, that um, give us an opportunity to address these challenges. In, first of all, information is available. Um, the huge sensor networks tell us a lot in terms of um, where the vehicles are and what the state of the vehicles are. And there is a lot of uh, computational support that we have, which is you know distributed either through the cloud or uh, through through uh, uh, fog computing, uh, things that are distributed, comp comp uh, has distributed comp computational platforms. I mean, every one of us has now a mobile phone, which is doing wonders in terms of the information transmission to the points that are of interest. So the question is, can we leverage all of these digital advances and evaluate new paradigms that give us an efficient urban uh, um, mobility solution? Um, and these, in these new paradigms are, are some of them I've, I've listed at the bottom, but they're not necessarily just uh, uh, limited to these technologies. But you know, we are all talking about self-driving cars. We're talking about connected cars, where there's a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication as well as a vehicle-to-infrastructure communication, and there are shared mobility solutions. And what I'd like to address is what some of the interesting um, problems are, uh, where not only are there uh, uh, these the challenges which can be addressed, which are enabled by these opportunities, but what the, our specific community um, can contribute to, and it turns out that there are uh, very interesting opportunities that can be addressed um, in order to accomplish, in order to um, reach the central goal of efficiency in urban mobility. So my talk is essentially going to address this topic. <coughs> So the, 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 the core of the solution here that I'd like to really uh, uh, get across in, in my talk today is the role that consumers, you and I, um, play in achieving this urban mobility. And uh, the kinds of concepts that I would like to address um, are these two. So transactive control and prospect theory, you will see, are, are the two paradigms, two concepts that the, these solutions will Build, uh, around. It turns out that essentially what they do is to provide us with a framework which contributes to a socio-technical modeling. And, and since we really understand you know, how control and optimization is done based on a, on a model, an underlying model, um, this socio-technical model then provides us with the opportunity for uh, figuring out what the corresponding principles are that we need to deploy. So I'd like to convey all of the, this, this, uh, this message, basically, in the form of two examples that we have, uh, two projects that we've carried out in our lab um, over the past um, five, six years or so. Uh, one which involves dynamic toll pricing, and the other is uh, shared mobility and on demand. And you'll see that this uh, a, a shared mobility on demand solution essentially consists of these two broad components of dynamic routing and dynamic pricing. So this is basically how my talk will be structured, and I will end, end with a summary. So let's. So there's a lot of words that uh, have perhaps introduced in here. So some, many of which require um, uh, careful explanation. So let me start from here. Now, 
in many infrastructures, um, and this is true actually for uh, the smart goodies, goods and smart cities, the two applications that uh, Tansel mentioned our lab has been involved in, and in many of these cases, essentially, there are assets, so there's supply, and there's demand, there's consumption. And so, what, what, so, to, so to give you an example, in the context of transportation, these would correspond to sim simply how much of a um, uh, highway occupancy uh, is available to the, the designer. Or if you're talking about uh, having multiple shuttles that are basically going to transport uh, people or, for that matter, uh, 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 goods on all of those uh, cases, sorry. Um, uh, uh, the, those would be shuttle occupancy. Or if it is uh, providing parking for um, uh, commuters, then this would be parking spaces. Or if it's providing um, the uh, transportation, shared transportation, then this would be the number of taxis, for instance. Now, on the other hand, consumption means that, okay, how many drivers do you have on the road? How many riders, how many commuters do you, do you have on the road? And so typically what you do is to make sure that in order to provide an infrastructure-wide solution, supply has to basically uh, be greater than or equal to, it should be, should be greater than or equal to the demand. This is sort of the simplest equation that you do, if you will, right, that one can provide. So then you have a satisfactory solution. And typically, this is the way in which infrastructures have been uh, planned and uh, implemented, right? So this is how, for instance, how, how it happens in, in Fargus, this is the energy sector, this is what happens in transportation as well. And one can imagine a similar equation in, in many, many different sectors. So um, um, in the context of, uh, of uh, 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 grids, for instance, by and large, this is assumed to be fixed. So there is demand, and you essentially change generation to, you to exceed demand. This is sort of the uh, um, standard principle that's been used. But then, as you can imagine, as infrastructures become more complex and you know, costs increase, one can't always increase the number of assets. So this equation is hard to satisfy. So then what that means is that, is there a way in which instead of thinking of the right-hand side as being fixed, you make it variable. So you provide, make these consumers, whether they're drivers or riders or what have you, empowered. So you give them the opportunity to be flexible so that if you have a given set of assets by simply adjusting this, you're able to satisfy the equation. So that's sort of the starting point in here. And so the, that basically is where there's opportunities for our, our uh, community, controls community, to get involved in and figure out a way in which you, you satisfy this equation. And so essentially, the, the point in here is that one degree of freedom, one knob that you have that you can twiddle in order to make this happen is a, what I would call as transactive control strategies, where there are basically prices that you can design and this provides an incentive to the consumers to basically make a decision to adjust their demand. And by adjusting the demand, you're able to satisfy this equation. So that by doing this, if you have fixed resources, because at some point these things are going to be presumably uh, prohibitively expensive. So if in order to provide this, this equation, this, this inequality that assesses the equal consumption, or greater than that, then you essentially have a more efficient resource utilization, which is utilization of these assets, so that all of the demand is met through these transactive control strategies. That's sort of the, 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 the idea behind the overall goal of the two examples that I would like to share with you today. So the first is dynamic toll pricing, and the other is uh, shared mobility on demand. And again, I'll go into the details uh, to tell you what these two examples are. So, uh, I, I, like I said before, there are a number of concepts that I mentioned in my outline. So one is empower, empowered consumers. I hope you now understand what I meant by that. The second is transactive control. And the uh, transactive control has a uh, history and its genesis really is in the area of smart grids. So let me tell you a little bit about this so that then we can translate this concept to see how this concept translates into transportation. Now, um, the idea here is that you have the power grid, and power grid basically um, has uh, supply and, and, and demand. 
And consumers are the ones that basically control the demand. And so the idea is that if I can provide an incentive in terms of the price, the cost of consumption to the consumers, then that cost basically enables them to make a decision. So these, if you will, are our actuators. And essentially, they're able to then change the demand, and that changing the demand in turn improves the grid infrastructure. So the picture in, uh, at the bottom gives you a little bit more of uh, information as to how this loop would proceed. So for instance, the grid provides a certain bid, and that bid is basically this, this, uh, this price. Right? And so that bid then gives an opportunity for the consumers to adjust the slope because the slope basically then corresponds to their comfort level. And so by sliding uh, this knob in here, you're able to control the slope. And what that does is say it gives you the, a indication to the grid that you're willing to adjust the set point of, let's say, for instance, your thermostat. And so by allowing that flexibility, you're basically giving an opportunity for the temperature to it change, to either go towards the blue or towards the black, depending upon what the desired preferences are for the consumer. And that in turn allows you to, so when you change the temperature, say for instance, from here uh, to, to here, then what that might do is to um, reduce the amount of, uh, or maybe you go from here to here, and that reduces the amount of consumption that you have, and therefore the price is something that can be lowered. So that's basically what happens in this timeline in here where you collect all of the bits, the information is then transmitted, then new decisions are being made, and then again, um, uh, the information is transmitted, et cetera. So there is information, decision making, and then implementation. So that's sort of the procedure here. So what that says is that you now have an opportunity to close a new loop. Where there wasn't a loop to be closed by saying, because earlier on all of consumption was fixed, but now you're making it variable. And the fact that you're making it variable says that now you have actuators and this is your control strategy. And once you determine what this overall model is, then you can come up with a control strategy that tells you how the desired objective can be realized, right? So that's really the problem here. And now you can take all of that and transfer this conceptual thinking to transportation in the form of traffic congestion. And price, again, here is a control variable that allows you to control the traffic congestion. And the different pictures that you see in here are all examples where there's been some sort of a proof of concept to say that, yes, this is something that is feasible. So what is it that we're saying everywhere? We're saying that by having a told price and having that be variable, you're able to control congestion. So this is in London where 33% reduction was reported. Uh, when these prices were changed, and uh, there were basically an in improvement in the amount of uh, you know the uh, uh, traffic as a result in terms of the traffic delay. The same thing is being reported in in uh, Stockholm that this is the the price structure. So as you can see, it's an open loop strategy, sort of fixed. But still, it, it within that it, the in, the input is varying, and that input basically then makes a big dent on the overall traffic density. This is in, uh, all these three in here are all United States. This is Virginia, Florida, San Diego, and everywhere there's very, very similar kind of an impact. And the one that I, I'll spend a little bit more time on is in Minneapolis, where they were able to report uh, average speeds of 50 miles per hour. So what all of this basically says is that varying toll prices can gives you an opportunity to aid, uh, to relieve, to alleviate traffic congestion. So if you, in fact, look at the history of toll pricing, you know, if you go back to the giving the stock here in the United States, um, let me make uh, some points that are U.S.-centric. So, uh, but it's these, these uh, discussions were um, things that were, you know, carried out by a number of researchers. So Pijou in 1920, you know, basically talked about the whole concept of tolling highway uh, roads. And so Pennsylvania Turnpike in the United States, for instance, was established in the 40s. And the idea here is that if you want to optimally allocate resources, and resources are almost always scarce, then you can't do that unless you, know, you introduce basically a specific tariff on those who are going to use the road. So that's basically the idea behind introducing tolls. If there's unconditional access, then you cannot optimally allocate resources to the point. And in fact, Building on this, in the 60s, Vic Ray, who's a Nobel uh, uh, Prize winning economist, um, uh, talked about 
varying toll prices. And so, you know, if you're going to have some periods where you have peak load and those that are off peak, then it doesn't make sense to have a fixed toll price with this point. And interestingly enough, varying toll prices are things that have been discussed soon in the Virant Corporation publication, and Singapore actually was one of the first cities to implement this congestion charge, which is in the form of a varying toll price, depending on when you enter, the, enter specific parts of the city. So the idea here is basically to build on this, but then actually move it towards a closed loop uh, paradigm rather than just open loop, where there will be congestion dynamics, and so there is traffic density that's being monitored. And that information then is being used in order to vary the toll price. That in turn gives the opportunity to, for drivers to make a decision to either enter the, a, a, a dynamic toll lane, uh, a toll lane or not. And that in turn will then affect the congestion. So that's the whole idea. So let's now go into a little bit more of a, of a, a, a detail of, of uh, uh, how we would go about doing this. So now you have a traffic model. So let's say there are so the input density and the input density is changing, and then there is an output density. So this is the tra underlying traffic model. And then um, the driver basically makes a decision, yes, I'm going to enter the toll lane or not. And so that is the, the other uh, sequence of events that we have to pay attention to. <coughs> now, in the traffic model, one could have, go about you know, designing the traffic model in many different ways. There's a lot of uh, uh, work that's been done in the transportation modeling literature. And there are many, many ways in which one can go about doing this thing. It's a huge area, that, and a number of folks in our community is involved in this, in this effort as well. But what we did in this particular project is to basically use a very, very simple uh, lumped parameter modeling, which is accumulator-based, to say, okay, this is what we are going to assume how the traffic behaves and how, you know, so strictly speaking, you can use, think of cars as particles in a flow, and, you know, it's a partial differential equation, and so one can analyze all of those things, and that's basically what's been done. But um, uh, we, in order for many reasons, one of the main ones being that we have to look at unsteady flow conditions and much of what we are trying to do is to really understand and model how the traffic behaves as you enter and leave congestion. Those are points where there's a tremendous amount of unsteadiness and a lot of nonlinearities. And for all those reasons, we couldn't really employ a PDE-based model, so this is more of a lump parameter model that we use. Now let's go to drivers. Okay, what is the, how do we make decisions? And so there's this there is the fundamental theory here is known as utility theory. And the idea is that we all have some sort of a utility function. And we try to make a decision, our probability of acceptance, you know, we can, uh, this is one way of in, in which you can model, which is the, the uh, logistical model. And so the whole idea here is that this, uh, as this uh, utility increases, your probability of acceptance goes to one. And again, it depends, varies from individual to individual. Some are risk averse and some are risk seeking. So as row increases, you move in this direction, et cetera. And therefore, you can come up with some sort of an aggregate population model that says this is basically how drivers have, have preferences, how they make their decisions. In, uh, let, to go into more detail, what exactly is the utility function? Well, we all care about how much time it takes for us. So the more time savings you have, the more attractive it is. Then uh, you know, this is a uh, uh, price. Obviously, the more the price, the less inclined we are. So this beta will be negative, and so all kinds of other negative externalities. You know, I just don't feel like it. There are many other uh, 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 factors independent of these two. Quantities also affect that. So this is our starting point, and this is our social statistical model. Right. So then what we did was we looked at a specific example in Minneapolis, which uh, I mentioned to you. It's been in operation since 2005, and what they have are sensors, which are interactive uh, loop detectors, which measures the traffic volume and speed. And what they have is basically then this toll lane, toll price basically changes in increments of, I believe, 25 cents. And, and so as the density increases, this, this price also increases so that people then choose to a, a, you know, uh, go um, on, on either no toll or the toll lane, and and uh, so the, these numbers, these uh, date, uh, the, uh, num uh, prices are all determined so that in the dynamic toll lane you can maintain 50 miles per hour. So there's data available which MNS has shared with us, which we then took. So there's different densities uh, even bef before, for instance, when when the uh, uh, drivers make this decision to join the lane, and when one after, and we, we took all of that data. 
And we said, okay, I'm going to, since we have proposed that this is the model, let's validate the model. And we got a very good fit uh, for a particular choice of the traffic flow model, which is this accumulator base one and this population model that I showed you in the previous slide. So with this, then this gave us more uh, of a, an evidence that says if we were you know, involved in by, hey, you know, this is a pretty good model, now we can go ahead and design a control strategy. And this was our control strategy. It was actually a simple nonlinear PI. Uh, and the way we designed this was to say, hey, we've got uh, this driver behavior model. And you know, we assumed that there were different parameters. And based on the data that we got, we basically did some, some, some identification. And then now this road dynamic, this accumulator model is like a simple first order filter. So given that you've got this and you've got your nonlinearity, the simplest strategy that we can think of is one where you invert the nonlinearity and you introduce the right kind of um, uh, 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 time constant so that you have, you're able to have the actual density approach the desired density as quickly as possible. And it actually worked very well. And here are, uh, are this is what the inverse nonlinearity looked like. And with and I'm not going to get into the details all of the controllers. The the, the, uh, the paper there are paper references that I'll mention at the end. And so these are the results of it that we got out of the numerical simulation. And so compared to the existing um, uh, pricing that uh, uh, they have, which is shown in the red, the results of what we got is shown here in blue. And so here, for instance, is the density, which is the, you know, the unit here is vehicle per mile per lane. And so obviously you can imagine that lower the density, the, the smaller the congestion, right? So depending upon the, um, what was a feasible equilibrium point, which basically comes out of the traffic flow pattern, we had picked 30 for this particular date. And I believe this was um, in, um, in uh, uh, October of 2014 is when we had this project, and so the, what you're looking at is based on the data that was of it, that of the drivers corresponding to that date in Minneapolis. And so you can see that compared to their strategy, what we are able to do is to do much better regulation. And what you're saying is, in during the peak hours, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. And you can see that that also deter helps uh, generate a much better throughput in terms of the overall flow. And we are able to maintain a much better speed um, of the drivers in, in the uh, toll lane. And what we were told was that we needed to have a price cap of below $8. And you can see that our price is significantly uh, lower than uh, that peak. Um, and so again, depending upon how tight a cap this is, our controllers can uh, generate different solutions. Um, and again, the variation here basically also accommodated the ability for, you know, like how quickly the prices could change, which was like every three minutes. And so that basically is what you're seeing in the step size. So this is the first example that I wanted to, to share with you. So what you can see now, you know, it's a very different way of what we would normally think of as a control problem, but it is a control problem. And it's a socio-technical system because you have now this hybrid beast, which is a combination of a traffic flow model and how drivers behave. And um, all of us, you and I, who take this road are all actuators. We are basically the actuators. And the control input that incentivizes us is uh, the toll price. And the decision that we make, which is the control input that goes into the socio-technical system, is the probability of acceptance. Yes, I'm going to join that road or not. And the, the toll pricing, the control strategy that we then chose used, using the social technical model is based on this transactor control principle where basically it's a, a financial transaction that motivates how, you know, the construction of this thing as opposed to a, a variation of a physical entity like voltage or force or position that we normally do in uh, engineering systems. But yet, the, that, the, the many of the principles that we understand can all be brought in here as the models and the model that I picked is very, very, very simple. Obviously, the traffic model, when you have merges and splits, will be more complicated. Um, the population model that I picked is again an uh, aggregate of what a lot of the drivers do. And we made some assumptions that indeed all these drivers have this utility function. That is something that needs to be looked at. But all of this says that here is an opportunity for us to go about thinking about what could be a control problem and how uh, what could be the underlying model and how you design a controller based on that model. 
So uh, the, the details of what I presented to you are all, you know, numerical experiments. And so we are uh, in the process of you know, implementing this thing in, a, in an actual uh, actual city. We've also been looking at some of this kind of transactive control ideas for high-speed trains, for um, uh, where essentially by changing the profiles of deceleration and acceleration, and you could um, make use of. Uh, there are certainly still constraints that the train has to leave and arrive at a certain time, and uh, and you've got limits on the acceleration, etc. But these the, many many of the the overall principles that I talked about here can be employed here as well, and we are getting some interesting results. So now I'd like to go to the second example, which is uh, sh uh, shared mobility on demand. So it's a to it's a totally different problem but it still is in the, in the area of transportation. And it's also something that, just like the previous example, all of us, I think, can relate to who, um, uh, who, need, who perhaps live in urban centers and need to you know, drive to work and come back, et cetera. And that has to do with um, the kinds of paradigms that are emerging when it comes to essentially moving from point A to point B. So really, the, the, this has to do with shared mobility on demand. If you think about it, much of what we have in a pre-Uber Lyft world is that we have we, we think of as uh, either getting from point A to point B either, either using public transportation or private transportation, right? But then, so you can see then what that means is that if you're here, you're uh, low price, high capacity, but as, they, as you go to, the, to this uh, uh, corner, it's higher price and lower capacity, but then you have a lot of convenience and flexibility in here. So, Typically, if you think of much of what happened, say, for instance, in the last century, you have had these binary options. What's now emerging, again, simply because there is the fact that we've got uh, GPS everywhere, we've got information, and we have the ability to make decisions and implement them on a distributed basis, um, that we all of these different opportunities are emerging. And so really what I'd like to address is a particular solution for shared mobility on demand. And how can we make 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 this thing happen? And what are are there some uh, fundamental principles of optimization and control that we can employ in this thing? And the way in which we are proposing is uh, going to uh, the solution is something like this. So it's a shared mobility on demand, which means think of it as a shuttle. It's a dynamic shuttle, and so there are a number of passengers who make a request, and then when, once the request with some specified pickup and drop off locations, then the shuttle server basically says, here is basically how where you would pick them up and then you would drop them off and you would also then specify the price. And once you do that, the passengers will decide whether to accept or decline the offer and the shuttle driver, the, the shuttle server sends out the right people. So this is the thing and those of you who have taken the Uber Express pool, this is basically how, you know, it's an example of something like that, right? But we're proposing a, a, a different algorithm in order to, to actually uh, carry out the solution. So if you think about it, it's a really a constrained optimization uh, problem. And so the, our, the solution that we propose is going to look like this. This is sort of a preview of what um, the rest of the slides is going to say. We're going to have a dynamic routing and we're going to have dynamic pricing. These are the two building blocks of this proposed shared mobility on demand solution. And there are a lot of details in here, which I will explain as we go along. So this is, so the broadly speaking, there's a routing and the pricing. So what, how will the dynamic routing work? So there's a whole bunch of pick up and drop off points, right? And so determine a dynamic route with flexible. So depending upon where they have to be picked up and dropped off, you determine a dynamic route with flexible stops. And you do it in a way so that you optimize the time cost. Now, it's a standard problem, but there is the twist that we have added here is that in addition to these things, we're going to, instead of thinking up of this as a traveling salesman problem that joins these different points, we're going to think of it as a TSP between regions. And for that, we introduce this concept of space window where every passenger is willing to walk a certain distance. And what that does is it basically gives us an order of magnitude reduction in the time cost, which we, which we saw in our studies. And it's amenable to dynamic routing and dynamic pricing, which I'll explain. So like I said, the main implication is that this is not basically a routing problem between points, but routing problem between regions. And there are a lot of details in here, which again, I'm going to refer to the, the, the paper, but the broadly speaking, 
the way the, the how we are propo proposing to carry out the solution is in three steps. First, we'll start with an objective function. So this objective function, like I told you before, it's got all these time costs. And then there is a price, there is a tariff, right? Just like the toll problem, time savings is a part that you would like to minimize, and right, you would like to minimize the cost. This is sort of like the overall objective function here, which you're trying. So in order to solve this problem, it's really high, extremely complicated. And so in order to do this first, I'm going to neglect the, now let's assume that every passenger accepts the offer. So there is no price uh, element, it's not, it's not a variable anymore. So first, let's just solve the problem for the, just the routing. And this turns out to be actually a mixed integrated quadratically constrained programming uh, thing. So instead of doing this, we're going to propose that um, instead of MIQCP, we will, uh, I'll, I'll explain what is it that we did. So this is assuming that all of the initial requests came before the shuttle left. And then may, let's make it a little bit more complicated where now let's say that it's evolving dynamically. The shuttle is already en route or shuttle already is picked, uh, 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 made the offer for certain passengers so the new ones are coming on board. And so you're uh, making the route dynamic as and when new pickup and drop off points come, which might change the route with respect to what was planned originally. And in the last step, I'd like to talk about how this would change with, with, with the price. Okay, all right. So uh, let me take five minutes to talk about just the steps one and two. So steps one and two will basically go like this. In order to really figure out the routing, the way we're going to do it is to basically have two uh, variables in here. One is the sequence of routing points and the other is routing points themselves. So the routing point corresponds to, say, if I may go back for a minute in here, Basically, where these, uh, given that every passenger is willing to walk a little, so you have this region. And so we will then identify clusters of data so that there are intersections. So instead of picking up every passenger, they all walk to this intersection, which means the routing point had to be determined corresponding to these intersections, right? So those are R's. And this, once you have the routing points, the sequence in which these things are going to be joined is S. And that basically is what we are doing in here. So you have an alternating minimization algorithm where you fix R and you optimize the cost over S, and then you fix S, optimize C over R, and the analytical details are in this paper, and it basically says, yes, this is something that can be done, and it will con converge under certain conditions. And the numbers that we get are very promising, which basically says, compared to an MIQCP, which is sort of the benchmark solution, we get uh, a much better computational efficiency, and which is determined by these points. And so these based, based on data that we got in Detroit from actual the commuters who take uh, these uh, dynamic shuttles. And the cost, the actual optimal cost that we get is just as good as the um, optimal solution, which is determined by, by these. And it, in all these cases, it converges significantly faster and even when it is suboptimal, you know, you remember this is a nonlinear constraint optimization problem, and there is always an optimal, there are, there, you cannot guarantee that there is no optimality gap, but in the, even in the suboptimal cases, it's fairly close to the optimal solution. So this is sort of says that, yes, this is something that is very feasible, right? And these are the results, like, for instance, this is a six-passenger shuttle, and you can see the different pickup and drop-off points based on where, where they are, and we determined all of the, the walking distances based on their specification. We will determine these clusters, and once we got the clusters, we got the routing points and the sequence, and this is basically the particular sequence uh, in which these passengers were picked up and dropped off. Um, sorry. Uh, okay, uh, 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 I beg your pardon. So there's more that is being said in this particular slide, which is that uh, not only did we carry out the static routing, but the dynamic routing had this particular solution as well, where we had a first batch of requests and the second batch. And instead of basically complete, completely completing the first batch and then starting with the second one, which would have required a lot of doubling back and forth, the dynamic routing basically saved, for, provided about 30% improvement in the overall time cost by simply recomputing the routing points, which basically changed from this point onwards. So this says that dynamic routing works, which means we are now ready to go on to talk about the third point, which basically again brings in what happens 
when you have uh, you 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 have a, you make your consumers empowered. So here now we are saying every passenger is, has the option of accepting or declining the offer. And the incentive that we are providing, or it could be a defense incentive, depending upon what your goal is, um, is uh, the price. So the tariff is basically used, being used as a control input in order to vary the overall underlying optimization, which could then produce the desired shared mobility on demand solution that best utilizes the available resource. And that's the last, uh, the step three. And for this, we need to take a closer look at what's going on in terms of what is the model, by the behavioral model that is appropriate. Remember what I said before, that there is a utility function. So now, you know, there's basically, for every passenger, there is a utility function, right? And like I said before, this is the utility function. There are time costs, and then there is a price cost. And so let us assume that you've got two, uh, you know, maybe you're going to take the Uber or you're going to take this dynamic shuttle. So the differential is this delta UK. And like you said before, the utility function basically is something like this, which goes from the probability of acceptance goes from zero to one as the utility increases. Now, it turns out that this is not necessarily the right model because there is a notion of, a, uh, all of this says that somehow we all behave in a deterministic matter, manner, right? There is this utility function. But we all have a stochastic element in us as well. And there's a very interesting concept that people have looked at, which is what we're going to utilize in here. And why is it that this is needed? Well, let us assume now, you know, this utility theory can be expanded to when you have several alternatives and there are several uh, prob uh, probabilities uh, of each of these um, alternatives are uh, occurring. So what do I mean by that? So in this particular case, we are talking about a shuttle arriving, right? So we cannot really give a deterministic thing saying that, yes, I will arrive in six minutes because there is a window, right? And if those of you who have taken Uber or Lyft, typically that's what happens in a pool, right? That there is a window of arrival. Each one of those things has a certain probability of actually occurring, right? So let's say that anyway, you arrive anywhere between five minutes to 15 minutes. Now, each of those has a certain utility for the passenger, right? So the overall utility is really an integral of this weighted uh, combination, correct? So all of this would then say correspond to, correspond to the ith utility function, and there could be several alternatives. One could be taking a private car or taking a bus, and what you have to do is to really compare this UI with respect to all of those things, right? But if you think about it, there is a lot of uncertainty in the arrival of the, uh, private, the dynamic shuttle. So there, given that there is a significant uncertainty, one needs to go to prospect theory rather than utility theory is the point that you're making. Now, this was developed by these two uh, 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 kind of men who won the Nobel Prize. Tversky passed away before the prize was awarded, but they developed it together. And what they basically say is that there is a certain quantitative wrap that you can put around the strategic decision-making of human beings. And that basically is what is encapsulated by the two functions, V and pi. And V is basically how we perceive utility, that for us, we have an asymmetric perception of gains and losses. And again, I'll explain to this quantitatively more in the next slide. Once we have that, then there is an overreact, an asymmetric reaction that we have to um, probabilities, so that we tr we tend to underweight low prob high probability events and overweight high prob small, low probability events, and I'll explain this to quantitatively. So um, this is actually a very nice work that's been done in the area of uh, smart grid by Winspoor and his group. And what they say here is that so the quantitative structure is basically uh, this, that you have a, a, you frame the problem first. So you think that this is, say, for instance, the price point that, you know, for a particular mode of transportation. Anything where the cost less is a gain, anything where it costs more is a loss, right? So then the value to the passengers ends up being asymmetric, that we sort of the value that you get for a gain after a while doesn't matter to us anymore, whereas the losses matter a lot more. That's what this is saying. So that's a very, very interesting way of it. So see what this does is it gives us an opportunity to model the stochastic behavior using this deterministic wrap, which is this, this nonlinear algebraic nonlinearity, which for controls folks, again, is a nice 
handle on the problem which we can utilize. Same thing with pi. If normally you would perceive everything, it would be just a simple linear straight line, but the perceived probability warps the probability function. It actually stops being a probability anymore, but this warping is basically quantified by something like this, that lower probability events have a higher uh, gain and then higher probability events have a lower gain. So really what ne one needs to do is to, instead of having this fixed objective utility, we have to go towards a subjective utility, and that's what this is doing. So basically what you're doing is you're have, you, have, you compute the overall utility differently depending upon whether it's a loss or a gain. And in each case, you, know, you start with the cumulative distribution, distribution function, and that in turn gives you this warped probability, and it's really this, this weighted sum that gives you the overall utility. And this is an important parameter. And the other thing is that instead of having an objective probability of acceptance, which is what we said before, we are now going to have a subjective probability of acceptance. And so ultimately, these two numbers, these two quantities are the ones that is going to play an important part in the overall socio-technical model for the shared mobility on demand solution. So basically, our, to give you a little bit more structure now, now that you, know, you have some more information about what we're talking about. We're going to say that I'm going to design a tariff, which is the, the price, using this passenger behavior model, which I just described to you, which is basically uh, calibrated using a reference and, of course, the actual probability of acceptance or, or probability of occurrence of these different outcomes. right? And then what this does is it gives you this um, a subjective probability of acceptance, which then you use as a model, and the shuttle server would basically design this price in such a way that whatever is the desired probability of acceptance, that will give you the most efficient uh, solution for how the shuttle should, should uh, the route should be um, uh, structured, and appropriately the tariff needs to be designed. Um, so, let me take another uh, four to five minutes to go into a little bit more detail as to what this prospect theory is saying so that it gives you more insight, you know, uh, more uh, uh, information as to how, what exactly is in each of these, these, these uh, blocks. So the first thing, the, the next set of slides is basically some, an analysis of this passenger behavior model. Remember, I quantified this, right? And so I told you a bit about what this value function looks like and what this pi looks like, what is the subjective utility, and what is the subjective probability of acceptance. So it turns out that there are some interesting properties for all of these things, that the probability of acceptance actually strictly decreases with the price. And remember that the reference that we pick can be anything. So and that really depends on what your alternatives are, right? Whether, whether the decisions, when this happens, we make a number of decisions throughout the day on any given day, which really depends on what's the option, right? What's the benchmark? What, else, what is it better than or was it, what is it worse than? So this alternative options, and again, it varies from place to place, from time to time, from country to country, but all of these things ultimately gives you a reference. And that reference then determines, in turn, determines a lot about how the passengers are going to accept or reject a particular offer. But these properties that we're able to derive say that here yeah, there are some nice axioms that you can hold on to. You know, there, these are some lemmas, if you will, and these lemmas give you insight into how to design a particular the, the tariff, the gamma. Remember what we're after? We want to determine how much it'll cost, as a, from a shuttle service point of view for the driver, for the rider, right? So the gamma, gamma is your control input, remember? So in order to design my control input, the more information I have about the model, the better I have. And these four properties, I won't go into the details of, and again, there's a reference at the end that will tell you uh, where this comes from, but these properties all essentially give us a handle on, on how the behavioral model looks like. But what is interesting is that there are, um, three implications that we, which help us in designing this, this tariff. And this is uh, very well known in the context of behavioral economics, and uh, this is a, a discussed by Kahneman and Schwartz, 
Tversky, and what we have done here is to quantify that in a, you know, so in a, using this engineering framework so that we can then evaluate how we can design the pattern. So the, in order to do that, essentially we have this uh, metric called rel relative attractiveness. And what it b basically is, um, how attractive is a particular um, uh, mode, like using, say, for instance, the dynamic shuttle, uh, for a passenger who is who who basically believe who functions according to this prospect theory versus someone who l looks at it objectively. So this is basically saying uh, how attractive is, say, for instance, the dynamic shuttle for a rational customer over a CPT customer. CPT is a discriminative prospect theory. Right? So if it's a non so that's what we're plotting in here in each case as a function of the price. And we are considering a specific example where there are two only two outcomes. And the cases that we're considering is where either the probability of that outcome occurring is very low or very high. Right? And the remember I told you that the reference that I pick can be uh, anything. So here it is a it is a, the uh, least the lowest value that you can imagine, and here is the highest value you can imagine. So there are four cases if you were to consider the combination. The main walk away here for, that I want you to, to get from this slide is that if you assume that you're a rational customer, then you really always will prefer the, uh, the probability of, of uh, uh, the relative acceptance here says that anytime it's positive, then this particular option is not attractive. So what it says is you will always prefer the other outcome. That's what this is saying. Whereas in the same case, if you were a CPT in kind of individual, then there are some prices for which this is attractive. So this says that if you have, so and this is what I've mentioned here, the presence of a risk-seeking passenger gives flexibility in increasing the tariffs, whereas the presence of risk-averse passenger requires additional constraints. So these are very qualitative and perhaps uh, very commonsensical, but CPT basically gives you a way of quantifying that into these things so that you can actually have an engineering design. So this is the first implication. Um, the next implication is that when you have mixed prospects, that is some cases are gains, some cases are losses, then there are uh, uh, quanti uh, prices for which you can, uh, for the probability of acceptance of the subjective one is lower. And so this says that the dynamic tariffs have to be suitably designed so as to compensate for this perceived losses. And the last one is also very interesting because what this says is that there is a sort of a property of invariance, which is that it doesn't matter what kind of distribution underlies a particular uh, problem. In all cases, no matter what, if you have a, if you're already, if you are inclined you know, there are these early adopters, right? What that means is that they're willing to take the risk and they're ready to embrace a particular mode of transportation. So if you have that kind of a, a reference, then you, in, in general, you're already, you know, that means you're already subscribed to taking a shared solution for whatever reason, then you have a higher willingness to pay. And that's basically what this is saying. Your probability of acceptance, the blue, is always higher than the alternative, which is a very interesting property. So with all of these things, our next step, and this is where we are in this project, and hopefully Tansel will invite me again in a year and I can tell you more about what we've been able to do. But now with all of these properties that we have determined, our next step is to really go about going to the details of what this, uh, this um, uh, model looks like and understand how to design the desired probability of acceptance for a given route. And with that, with the travel times, we then will design the dynamic pricing. And that uh, is, is basically what this is, uh, what, how, uh, how far we have, we have come in this overall shared mobility on demand solution. So the summary here is that this problem is very interesting and the solution here is really a centered in a optimization and control uh, predicated on a socio-technical model. And the optimization comes in the form of dynamic routing and control comes in the form of dynamic pricing. And just like in the previous example, the empowered riders are actuators and the uh, socio-technical model that, we, uh, that underlies this problem is really based on prospect theory.
And what we are uh, in the process of doing is to design the desired probability of acceptance using reinforcement learning. And we will determine the dynamic pricing strategy, just like we showed you in the context of dynamic toll price using transactive control. And it's being evaluated for implementation in a, in a few cities. So I hope that I've been able to convince you that this urban mobility is an exciting problem where all kinds of paradigm shifts are occurring. And empowered consumers basically give you the first handle of the problem where consumption is not fixed anymore, but varying. And by that doing this, we uh, have new solutions for urban mobility, which can impact on the alleviating highway congestion through the notion of dynamic toll pricing and a transactor control strategy, and shared mobility and demand where dynamic routing is accomplished through optimization and dynamic pricing through control. And so you can see that there are a number of innovations that this field has, and there's all kinds of opportunities to do better in, you know, in every, both examples, I've really used very, very simple models, but as we make the problem more complicated, there's certainly a lot of uh, improvement and new and uh, re, uh, opportunities for new research. And the, uh, the, 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 the three papers listed here uh, give you more details in terms of um, how all of the, the underlying theory uh, works out and what the numerical solutions look like. I'd like to thank you very much, and that concludes my talk. Anu, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Perfect. So, um, so we have a couple of minutes uh, for questions. So, um, again, uh, you can ask questions in two ways. If you like, um, you can directly uh, send a message through the chat uh, to me, then I will read your question to Dr. Anaswamy. Uh, second way, you can unmute yourself and ask the question directly if you prefer this. But again, a session is being recorded, so if you don't want uh, your voice to be included, you can directly ask the question through the chat box. Okay, um, Anu, we got uh, our first question. Now, let me open it. I will read it to you. Um, okay. Um, this question is from John Cooper. It seems like dynamic toll pricing works by limiting people's access to faster lines. If they can't afford the toll line, they will take the slower route. Of course, this will have an effect of limiting congestion, but that comes from sacri sacrifi sacrificing personal mobility. I think the true problem is how do we increase personal mobility? Reducing conge congestion is a way to achieve that, but if it's done by reducing overall mobility, then the underlying situation is not really better. Actually, it seems worse. Isn't the congestion, congestion shifted uh, to the non-toll route, making travel times even slower for those who can't afford the toll? Dynamic toll pricing seems to be improving the situation for wealthy drivers at the expense of poor drivers. Is this assessment correct? If so, do you have any comments on it? Um, I, 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 uh, I think it's a very good question and uh, the point is very well taken. So you're absolutely right that the, the, any kind of transactive control basically brings in the notion that there is a range over which this price is, uh, can be varied. So it really is a question of the infrastructure as to what that range, what range is acceptable. So the assumption here is that the range that's been specified is something that has been evaluated by the infrastructure and you know all the policy and the regulatory decision um, uh, considerations have been taken into account to specify the range. And so within that range, certainly I agree. As you go towards the higher range, it's sort of tending towards wealthy, and the ones at the lower end are are, are poor. I, uh, I I agree. So it's really making sure that those limits are things that are acceptable and uh, something that the infrastructure is ready to implement. And of course, that those decisions, I'm, uh, the, the, the technology that I'm proposing here are, are not addressing. So, but we're assuming that you start from that boundary. If that is something that is not appropriate for that infrastructure, then this is not a good, good, good um, solution, I agree. Thank you, Anna. Um, so, um, Anu, can we say, so if they have, in other questions, can they directly email you? Of course, sure. 
and it will be a great pleasure to invite you again within one year. <laughs> Thank you. you know, anytime you like. Just, you know, yeah. Thank you. It is always a pleasure to have you. Wonderful. So with this, um, oh, one more question. I don't know if you still have time. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, no problem. Uh, this question is from TR. What will happen if there is a bumper-to-bumper -bumper congestion? Is there a way you are incorporating, incorporating such a situation like upper bound for pricing? Right. So there are limits, obviously, yes. In fact, uh, you know, uh, in something, I, uh, in some sense, the picture I showed you, if it is like that, then there is no room for, there is no wiggle room here, really, where the demand is so high that um, even whatever flexibility is available is simply not going to give you new equilibrium points. Um, uh, if you look at the toll pricing problem, you know, essentially the, the assumption there is why is it that we are saying uh, that when you vary the price, you can vary the flow. Remember that the underlying problem is really like a partial differential equation, which means that as you change the equilibrium, and that's what you're doing by essentially changing the, 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 the regulating the input density, then you're basically giving an opportunity for the equilibrium to shift to a new point where, in a PDE, unlike ODE, changing the equilibrium point also changes the Jacobian. So essentially, your dynamics around that changes, and therefore, you have a much uh, tighter um, but the eigenvalues are much higher, and therefore you're able to have all the transients side on much faster. So uh, that's why you're able to actually have an improved traffic flow compared to uh, the, the other equilibrium point, right? So all of this presupposes, therefore, that there are uh, there exist equilibrium points, multiple <laughs> ones, um, for a given traffic flow. When you have extreme congestion, that something is no longer valid, and so now. So, yeah, so that's why. Thanks so much, Anu. So, um, Anu, once again, thank you very much for your time, and yeah, it was a great pleasure to uh, host you here. If uh, our uh, attendees have more questions, then that they will email you. And with this, um, thanks everyone for attending. Um, then we will, uh, this, this ends our uh, online seminar series for Spring 2019, and we will continue on post. Thanks again. Okay, thank you. Have a great day. All right, bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.